Suspense! Wherever hospitality is a gracious art, the best serve C-R-E-S-T-A, B-L-A-N-C-A, Cresta, Blanca, Cresta Blanca. Yes, following a tradition of pleasing the world's most discriminating travelers, American Overseas Airlines offers its passengers Cresta Blanca California wines. To help you distinguish your entertaining, Cresta Blanca has created a magnificent selection of wines to please every taste, to enrich every occasion. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, for your everyday enjoyment. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, bring you Miss Lynn Barry in Murder by an Expert. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. I didn't want to hurt him. I didn't want to hurt him, but I couldn't do it while he lay there sleeping so peacefully. He had to be awake when it happened. He had to be awake. Bob? Bob? Hmm? Bob, get up. Get up. What's the matter? I haven't... We... Well, we have an audition. What time is it? 20 minutes to 11. An audition in the middle of the night? There's a club over on 8th Street needs a dance team. Tabor just phoned me. Said to get over there right away. I didn't hear any phone. You were asleep. Usually wakes me. All right, all right. I'll get dressed. I suppose they want us to go on tonight. We're not going to be much good. I think it could wait till morning. Hmm. That was step number one. While he was dressing, I stepped out to the payphone in the hall. I could hear him in the bathroom. I looked at the watch. I didn't have to rush. I had time, enough time. Yes? Hello, Jimmy? Was that you, Edith? Yes. Jimmy. Jimmy, we're battling again. I think this time it's the end. He's going to leave me. No, no, that's silly. Is he there now? Yes. Well, put him on. I'll talk to him. I... Oh, he's in the bathroom. He, he wouldn't come to the phone for me anyway. Perhaps it's best we split up. I don't know. No, no. Well, you're the best thing that ever happened to that kid brother of mine, and I won't let him do anything you'd be sorry for. I suppose I drop up there now and see him. I don't know, Jimmy. I... I'll be right over, kid. You just sit tight. Leave it to me. I've been managing that spoiled little brat for years. I'll be right up there. Yes, Jimmy. Step number two. The big brother was going to step over and straighten everything out I looked at the watch again It was a quarter to eleven He'd get there at eleven Just the time Just the right time All right, are we going or aren't we? Oh, you got ready quickly Who was that on the phone? Wrong number Yeah? Did you tell the wrong number you couldn't go out with them tonight? I said it was a wrong number I heard you You don't believe me? You're going to get ready to go out or aren't you? I didn't like to have it that way, but that was how it had to be. Violent, angry, like there'd been an argument. That was how it was going to have to look. He turned his back to me and started lifting our costumes into a little suitcase. I slid the knife into my hand. Cold, cold. Even the wood handle was cold. What would the steel feel like to Bob? I came very close to him. He started to turn. Where's your other And I jumped forward quickly and lost the knife somewhere in his throat. <laughs> to let the knife slip out of my hand that way. I stood quietly until he stopped driving. Then I reached down and lifted the knife up and wiped the handle off. I had to do that. Then I dropped it again. For a moment, I watched the blood soaking across the rug. I couldn't take my eyes off it. I was fascinated by it. Then, then I snapped awake. I looked around the room. I don't know what for. I'd taken care of everything, but I looked anyway. And then I saw it. The little pocket watch that George had loaned me for the timing because everything had to be timed right, just right. I must have put it down there when I did it. I slipped it into my handbag, put on my hat and coat. It was 10 to 11. That was when he died. 10 minutes to 11.
For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Lynn Barry in Murder by an Expert. Roma Wines presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is brought to you by Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. So cool to come home to. That's what thousands are saying about that wonderful warm weather thirst quencher, Roma Wine and Soda. Yes, the tastiest treat in town. Cool Roma Wine and Soda is a tempting treat for the family, a delightful refresher to serve friends who drop in these sultry evenings. Just half fill tall glasses with your favorite Roma California wine, such as Roma Burgundy or Sauterne. Pop in a few ice cubes, fill with sparkling water, sweetened to taste. Remember, wine and soda made with Roma is better tasting because Roma wines are selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Lynn Barry as Edith Reed in Murder by an Expert, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was ten minutes to eleven when I slipped out of the apartment. The timing had to be right, just right. That was when I'd killed him. Ten minutes to eleven. I had to get away quickly now. It had to be the back stairs. I went down them as quickly as I could, my heart beating wildly. If anyone saw me, it was the end. I'd die in the chair for what I'd... Yes, please. Now, shall we go down, Daisy? There's the elevator. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. trembling violently when I hit the street. Nobody had seen me. Nobody had seen me. I lost myself in the Broadway crowds. But all of a sudden, I didn't want lights. I wanted quiet and shadows. I cut across to fog. I passed the apartment house once. There was no one around. I came back and dove down the stairway marked service entrance. I walked through the cellar. Edith. Edith, here, over here. Oh, George. Anyone see you come in? No one. I'm sure no one did. Oh, Shh. sure, Josh. Come on. Up the stairs here. I thought we might use a service, a service elevator, but it's too risky. It's only one flight up. I... Steady now. Corridor's clear. Come on. Come on. Ah, there. There, it's all over. It's all over, dear. Oh, George, hold me. I'm shivering so. <laughs> Well, it's all over, dear. It's all over now. There were no more things to do now. No more steps to take cautiously, carefully. I was on the top of the ladder now, and I could reach out and pluck the stars right out of the sky. I had to stay up there. I had to stay up there. I wasn't nervous at all, Val. You'd have thought I'd been doing that sort of thing all my life. Oh, you're wonderful, Edith. All I remember is the blood on the carpet. It'll have to be cleaned, you know. Mm-hmm. We will be happy now, won't we, Georgia? Oh, uh, that, uh, that will be the police. Oh, I'd forgotten. I was thinking it was all over. It's uh, just this little more. Do you feel up to it? Oh, I'm all right, dear. I'll be fine. You'll see. I, I won't throw it all away now. Open the door. Ms. Reed? Yes? We're from the police department, Ms. Reed. The police department? What? Uh, well, Ms. Reed, your husband's had an accident. Bob? Tell me. Tell me. He's been stabbed, ma'am. He's dead. Bob? What? We'd like to have you come down to headquarters to identify him. And... Bob? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I cried then. It was sort of a release. I was tired and lost all of a sudden, and I cried real tears. I knew they would be impressed. 
I was crying because I was tired. And they would think I was crying because of... because of Bob. And that was good. That was good. I thought we might go downtown in a police car. Instead, they had a cab waiting. And they were considerate. And they drove slowly. Only they drove slowly along Broadway and I couldn't ask them not to. And I had to close my eyes to keep out the light, to hold down the memories. And that was good, too. They thought the pain I was having was grief over Bob. He's in here, this door here. On the table here. Just a lump under a white sheet. Just a long lump under a white sheet, all that was left of Bob. All that was left of the man who'd been my husband. I'll have to take the sheet off his face now, Miss Reed. I... Steady. This your husband? Yes. Yes, that's Bob. Steady, steady. That'll be all in here. You'll come with me. You'll come in here. What? It'll only be for a moment, I'm sure. This is Lieutenant Milgram in charge of the case. This is Miss Reed. Oh, Miss Reed. Now, won't you uh, sit over here? Thank you. I am. Uh, I know you must be under a terrific strain, and I won't keep you any longer than I have to, Mrs. Reed. I'll make things as easy for you as I can. And this is George Lee. How do you do, Mr. Lee? How do you do? We've all been terribly shocked by this. Yes. Who would want to kill Bob? He had no enemies. Was it robbery or... No, I'm afraid it was no robbery. But then what? You went out tonight. Yes. Early? Yes, at about seven. I, I don't know the exact time. Close to seven. The doorman would know. As we asked him, he said seven. When did you return to your apartment? I... I hadn't been home all night. Where were you? Well, she was at my place. You must know that. Your men picked us up there. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, she was with me. Oh, on, on business, I assure you. Mr. and Mrs. Reed were two of my dearest friends. I, I'm a dance director. I was working with them on a routine. He had wanted me to say I'd been in another man's apartment. He had wanted me to come right out and say it. Cops thought it was unnatural to be too good. They became suspicious if you were too good. There was a leaky water faucet that kept dripping somewhere in the room. And you stayed in the apartment till now? Yes, of course. I see. What time did you get to Mr. Lee's apartment? About 7.15, I guess. Doorman up there? Yes. Suppose he saw you go in? Yes. Oh, look, Inspector. Lieutenant. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. You're not thinking that, that Edith here could have had anything to do with this horrible thing? I didn't say so, did I? Well, I can assure you that Mrs. Reed did not stir from my apartment all evening. Uh -huh. Well, before you left your own place, Mrs. Reed, you asked a neighbor to go into your apartment at 11 o'clock and wake your husband up, didn't you? Yes. Bob was supposed to come with me to Mr. Lee's, but he had a headache and said he would lie down for a while, try to sleep it off and join us later. I asked Mrs. Ryan to drop in on him at 11 and wake him. Uh-huh. I knew he would sleep it out if I left him alone, and I, I did want to get this routine finished. I see. Mrs. Ryan didn't... didn't stab him. No. No, Mrs. Ryan didn't stab him. She went in at 11, as you told her, and she found Mr. Reed lying on the rug and someone standing over him with a knife in his hand. Who? What? Who? Joe. Joe, ask one of the boys to ring in, uh, you know. Yes, sir. The timing had been perfect. Everything had gone well. I was aware that I wasn't shivering anymore. I was complete master of myself now. I had nothing to be afraid of now. Why, he'd even picked up the knife. Edith! Oh, Edith, thank heaven. Jimmy, what? Edith, will you tell these guys what's what? They, they seem to be in some kind of a fog. They think I killed Bob. I don't know what's happening to me, but... Easy. I... You don't mean he... Yes, he's the fellow Mrs. Ryan found with a knife in his hand, his own hunting knife. Oh, no, no, that's impossible. Bob was his brother. Mm. Jimmy, I know you didn't do it. Well, of course I didn't do it. Tell him about the quarrel. Tell him about the phone call. About the quarrel? The phone call? Yeah, tell him that I was sort of a misfixit for you two when things got out of hand. Tell him how I felt about Bob and you. What quarrel, Jimmy? What phone call? What quarrel? Well, the one you had with, uh, tonight with Bob. I? What's the matter? Tell him about calling me up. 
Jimmy, what are you talking about? What am I talking about? You, you called me tonight from the apartment and said you and Bob were splitting up and, and... Well, why are you shaking your head? I just don't know what you're talking about, Jimmy. Bob and I didn't quarrel. I didn't call anyone. What but time did the call come? Oh, uh, uh, about a quarter to 11 and around that, I, I said I'd be over and try and straighten things out. Mrs. Reed was with you at the time? What? Why, well, yes, yes, certainly. Did you make any calls? No, none, none. Edith, for heaven's sake! Was anybody with you when you got the call? Uh, no, no, I was in bed. It was your knife, wasn't it, Mac? Oh, yes, but I, I don't know how it got to Bob's apartment. It was there when I got there. Bob was dead when I arrived. You quarreled with your brother on occasion, didn't you? Not quarrel. No, I was the older brother. I had to straighten him out once or twice. Uh, Mrs. Ryan says you often quarreled with him. Oh, they weren't quarrels. Edith, she used to call up when things went wrong, and I'd hustle over and help out. I... I had a lot of influence with Bob. I tell you, I... Oh, Edith, you're kidding with me. Tell him. Tell him how I felt about Bob. Go on, tell him. You... You killed him. You killed him. Edith! I told you I loved him. I told you that the last time you asked me to leave him and go with you. I told you that the last time and the time before that and the time before that. Edith, you... You mean he and your husband quarreled over you? Yes. Edith, you... Why, well, you don't know what you're saying. You had to kill him. Love you. I hate you. I hate you. What? I'm She's tired of hating you. She's crazy. Right. You're lying. Take him away. Edith. Edith. I did it well. I did it superbly. I was sorry for Jimmy, but he didn't count, really. It was him or me. I was after happiness, and nobody was going to stand in my way. Nobody. Nobody. They drove me home in a police car. George went home alone. I suddenly remembered I hadn't a chance to give him back his watch. It was a foolish little thought to have now. The night air will make you feel better. Cool, you know. Yes. Your, uh, your husband was a fairly wealthy man, wasn't he? I don't know. Yes, I, I suppose he was. Didn't use much of it, did he? I... Why? Well, he he wanted to be a great dancer. Show business was in his blood. Oh? He said he was going to become as great as Astaire or Bolger or Kelly. Oh. And he was going to do it the way they did it, the hard way. He wasn't going to buy success. He insisted we live on our club earnings and ignore the other... The other... I see. Well, you'll be quite a wealthy woman now. I don't want to think about it. Here we are, Chief. Oh. Well, good night, Mrs. Reed. Oh, it's almost two o'clock. Good morning, Mrs. Reed. Good morning. Want me to see you in? No, no, I'll be all right. Thank you for everything. Oh, good evening, ma'am. Hello, Joseph. Six, please. I'm, uh, I'm sorry Thank about you. Thank you, but Joseph. You're, uh, you're not going to sleep up there. Are you? Yes, Joseph. There's nothing to be afraid of. When you love someone the way I love Bob, it... Oh, yeah, I understand, ma'am. You're right. Oh, here, here we are, ma'am. Thank you, Joseph. I stood in the doorway for a moment before I snapped on the light. I... I thought I could smell the death in the air. They do in novels. But there was nothing. Nothing. I snapped the light on and closed the door. The police had cleaned the room nicely. There was only the spot on the rug. Only the blood on the rug. There was nothing here to be afraid of. No voices. No ghosts, nothing. I was tired. I needed sleep badly. I went into the bedroom and locked the door and tried to sleep. Can you be so tired that you can't sleep? Can't even force an eyelid down over your eye. Can you be that tired? And the blackness and the quiet, they seem to be smothering me. And then, and then I heard it. At first, I didn't know what it was. 
I wasn't frightened. I just didn't know what it was. George's watch, of course. The little pocket watch he'd loaned me in my handbag on the bedside table. How silly. They sound so loud in an empty room at night. I snapped on the light. It wasn't that I was afraid. There was nothing to be afraid of, not really. But suddenly I was just a lonely little girl. I, I didn't want quiet now. I wanted to hear voices, happy sounds, happy noises. I wanted... I wanted George. I needed to be with him. I needed terribly to be with him now. George. Oh, Edith, what's the matter? <laughs> I forgot to give you back your watch. Oh, Edith, don't be silly at a time like I this. I know it. It isn't really that. Well, what is it? I've got to see you. I'm coming over. No, 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 wait, wait. At this hour, it's silly, Edith. It's dangerous. I can't help it, darling. I've got to see you. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not here. There's a, there's a little place on 7th Avenue, an all-night lunch place near 40th. Dillard's, I think it is. Right away. All right. All right. <laughs> The place looked empty when I got there, only a fat little man at the counter slicing some kind of meat. And then I saw George at the back at one of the few tables in the place. I ran back, ran back. Dearest. Edith, no, 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 no. It's not smart. I just want you to hold me. Hold me for a moment. I need you so Edith, much. please, the waiter, the waiter. Oh. Stop trembling. You're trembling. Yeah, let it be, folks. Uh, two coffees, please. Do you want anything else, Edith? Just you. Huh? I bought him tonight. I'll get it. Uh, two coffees. Just two coffees, please. Sure. sure. You're overwrought. Why? Because I said I bought you. <sighs> when will we get married, dear? Soon? Soon? You should be home sleeping. I suppose we will have to wait a little while for appearances' sake, but set a date, dear. Now, go ahead. Please, the waiter, the waiter. Two coffees. <coughs> Next month, perhaps? In June? Edith, please, let's discuss this whole thing tomorrow in the sunlight. When... When things are normal. In July, then. Sometime in July. I... Uh, What's the matter, George? I... When, then? I can wait, darling. I've waited this long. Let's get out of here. No. No, George. I'm not going to move until you answer me, George. When are you going to marry me? Never. I'm not going to marry you. You're joking. Don't joke with me, George. I'm not going to marry with you. Now, I don't want to tell you this now, but... Maybe it's better. Maybe the quicker we get things straight, the better. Get things straight? Please, please listen to me. Edith, you're a rich woman now. You've got a lot of money out of tonight. You got rid of him at a nice profit. So why not look at it as a good business deal and nothing else? I don't understand. A good business deal for both of us. We both took chances. George, I don't... I want half of what you inherit, the insurance and such, for my silence and my lies and, and my general help. I'm not in love with you, Edith. I, I never was. I, I, I needed the money. There's someone else? Yes. There always was, even while... Yes, yes. And you want to blackmail half of my money to finance you and someone else. A business deal. The whole thing was just a business deal. Please. That's very funny. Bob wouldn't give me a divorce, and even if he had, I'd have gotten no money. And you and I would have needed money to live on. So I killed him. All that terror and all that blood for a business deal. A business deal. It's very funny. <laughs> it's really very funny. Are you okay? I got out of there somehow and back to the apartment. Oh, I knew what I was going to do. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I took the little watch out of my handbag, the little pocket watch that George had loaned me so that everything would go right, just right. The little watch with his initials on it and the inscription from his father. I held it in my hand a moment, listening. Then I set the hands back to ten minutes of eleven the exact time, the time he died, the time I killed him. 
and I put the little watch down on the floor and ground it under my foot. I picked it up and listened. It was stopped. Broken and stopped. Stopped at ten minutes to eleven. Lieutenant Milgram, please. Lieutenant, this is Edith Reed. I lied to you, Lieutenant. George did it. We planned it together. Why am I telling you? Guilty conscience, I suppose. Oh, you can prove it all right. I found his watch under a corner of the carpet. It was broken during the struggle. Yes, it had stopped. At ten minutes to eleven. Yes, that was the time. Ten minutes to eleven. It's terrible to love someone as much as that. I wonder if the other one loved him that much. But he'll never know now. And I, I suppose he'll never forgive me. George will never forgive me. Suspense. Murder by an Expert, starring Lynn Berry. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma, California Wines. Those better tasting wines from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Better taste is the reason Roma Wine and Soda is one of America's favorite summer refreshers. In Roma, you enjoy better taste that starts with the natural juices of California's choicest grapes. Then, with ancient skills and unmatched wine-making resources, Roma guides this grape treasure unhurriedly to peak taste perfection. These Roma wines are placed with mellow Roma wines of years before. And from these, the world's greatest wine reserves, Roma later selects for your pleasure. Try a refreshing Roma wine and soda made with robust Roma California Burgundy or delicate Roma Sauternes. After a sweltering day, it's so cool to come home to. And so much more delicious when made with better-tasting Roma wine, America's largest selling wine. Lynn Barry may soon be seen in the Eagle Lion production, Man from Texas. Tonight's suspense play was by John Shaw. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Jerome Cowan as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Stay tuned for the thrilling adventures of the FBI in Peace and War following immediately over most of these stations.